Right. Hi. Good evening, and welcome to these deliberations in PCOS. And uh, it's great to see that all of you have joined and uh, ready for the lecture. I know these are tough times. A pandemic is uh, looming over us. I hope wherever you are, you're very safe and uh, you have the energy and the enthusiasm to continue reading. Uh, tough times, but uh, we all know that tough times make tough people and tougher people always go through these times easily. All right. Chal, let's start uh, with PCO's discussion and uh, those who have had uh, discussions earlier with me would know that we should always know the basics well. So I'll start with the outright basics of the menstrual physiology first and then we'll get into PCOS, all right? So this is the picture of one of my patients and uh, you can see the picture of PCOS. This is the ovary here and this ovary, you can see that there are multiple small follicles, isn't it? So upfront, I've shown you what a PCOS ovary looks like, isn't it? So let's move on and see what's the outright basics. And we know that from the hypothalamus, the GnRH would uh, stimulate the pituitary and the FSH comes out to make the follicle grow. The follicular stimulating hormone makes the follicle grow in size and this growing follicle makes the estrogen. Estrogen acts on the uterus and it causes the proliferation of the endometrium, isn't it? So proliferation is by estrogen and uh, this estrogen also gives a feedback to the brain. So this is a negative feedback, isn't it? It's a negative feedback to the hypothalamus to tell the FSH that no more FSH is required. But yes, growing estrogen will also give a positive feedback to the hypothalamus and that positive feedback will be to the LH that yes, the follicle is ready and the big ready follicle with the growing estrogen gives a message to the brain that okay, the follicle is ready, send in the LH. So next thing, the hypothalamus will stimulate the pituitary to make the LH increase. Now when the LH increases, it ruptures the follicle and that ruptured follicle now this is known as the corpus luteum so the corpus luteum will make progesterones and the progesterone will act on the uterus to now make the endometrium secretory so yes the fsh is for estrogens please i have always told this many times in my lectures fsh is for the estrogens and the lh is for the progesterones so we'll remember this basic always all right so this is what happens normally now when we know this normal let us see what happens in a normal menstrual cycle the coordination of the events so if you see that the fsh is high initially this is the fsh loop so high fsh will start recruiting five six seven antral follicles and from this antral follicles the low fsh will maintain growth of only one so one of these follicles, the smarter follicles than the other ones. So one of these follicles will start becoming bigger and bigger and then it will become a mature size with a mature oocyte in it. See the FSH is high initially. The high FSH will recruit 6-7 follicles, the antral follicles. And the low FSH will maintain growth only of one of these. So one of these follicles which is smarter than the other follicle will start growing progressively in size and that follicle will become the mature follicle with the oocyte all right now this oocyte is ready to come out but it needs the lh remember so that high estrogen which is coming out can you see this follicle as it is growing in size the estrogen is increasing in amount and this high estrogen gives that positive feedback to the brain to cause the LH surge. So this LH surge has happened, it ruptures the follicle, the oocyte comes out and when the oocyte comes out, this now becomes the corpus luteum which starts making the progesterone. Can you see this progesterone, this progesterone was low so far, the progesterone will start increasing. So corpus luteum will start making the progesterone increase. So what was growing first, can you see these glands are growing now with the estrogens but with the increasing progesterone these glands will become secretory so now these glands can you see i'm filling them up to show you that what happens in secretion so now these are the glands so these are the secretory glands and now when they're full of juices full of 
um, you know, nourishment for the embryo, the endometrium is good for an implantation. So this endometrium is getting ready every month for a pregnancy. That's what we know. But pregnancy doesn't happen every time. Pregnancy happens only once or twice in a woman's life. So what happens? This corpus luteum keeps waiting. It keeps waiting, you know, that when the corpus luteum is formed after the ovulation, on the sixth day of the ovulation, the sixth day of the ovulation, that is the uh, 28th day, the implantation can happen the earliest. So yes, the sixth to the another 10 days, nine to 10 days the corpus luteum will work. Six to the 25th day, roughly is a good time for the embryo to come and get implanted. And in this time, the embryo doesn't come, the corpus luteum degenerates, isn't it? It starts degenerating on the nine to 10 day. But yes, the MCQ is, when it starts degenerating, it starts degenerating from the 9th to the 10th day onwards, the corpus luteum will start degenerating. When does the degeneration of corpus luteum completely happen? That happens around 15 day. So yes, the corpus luteum starts to degenerate. You can see the progesterone levels are now reducing. Now when the progesterone reduces, this endometrium starts to shed and that's what causes the menstruation. Now, that was a quick uh, uh, recall of all the menstrual events which we people have known so well. Now let's see what happens in PCOS. So what happens in PCOS? What does the ovary look like? A normal ovary of roughly around 3 into 4 centimeter size, 3 into 3.5 into roughly 4 centimeter in size, that ovary, what happens to it in PCOS? In PCOS, the ovary has these multiple big follicles, like the name suggests, polycystic ovary, an ovary full of cysts. Well, that is exactly what it is not. PCOS ovaries does not look like a ovary full of cysts. No. Polycystic ovary is a misnomer. All of you should remember polycystic ovary does not have any cysts. There are no cysts in the ovary. So I always tell you in my classes that please remember poly not cystic ovarian syndrome. If you remember that, the confusions are lesser because so many doctors would come and tell me, sir, my sister is having polycystic ovaries. When are you going to do her surgery? Please, there are no cysts to remove in a polycystic ovary. So first mistake, there are no cysts in the ovary in polycystic ovary, okay? This is a misnomer. Steen and Leventhal, when they coined this, they saw something which looked like cysts. So they just started calling it polycystic ovary. And that's the cause of confusion in a lot of us doctors. At least I had it when I was in my MBBS, all right? So let's move on and see what does it actually look like. So remember the appearance which I keep uh, rem uh, reminding in the classes? the ring of pearl appearance remember in on the ultrasonography we have an appearance which shows a ring of pearl is seen in the ovary now how big are pearls see i've shown you a picture here of pearls now these are the pearls the small pearls the pearls are a very very small um, you know these are made in the oysters because of some foreign body and that foreign body that comes into the oysters they will start depositing calcium all over it so these pearls which are formed in the oysters they are very very small things okay so the size of the pearl is not generally more than seven eight millimeters or nine millimeters so that's why we say a ring of pearl appearance so now you see exactly what this is multiple small pearls multiple small follicles all over the ovary so can you see these follicles all over the ovary it looks like a necklace of pearls so if you remember that it's a ring of pearls ring of pearl appearance small pearls are small don't we say that uh, when that woman was crying pearls of tears dropped over her cheeks isn't it we say pearls of tears isn't it pearls will be small so once we understand this we will not have a problem in PCOS follicles are small now if you remember this punchline that they are small follicles. If you remember this punchline, then things become very easy. First of all, it is not many cysts in the ovary. Then these are multiple small follicles. Now these multiple small follicles, how do they look in the ovary? This is the ultrasound picture which I wanted to tell you. Now, presence of 20 or more. I know you people remember 12 
follicles or more. But now things keep changing. So the updates are uh, ever since the 2018 ESHRAE conference, a lot of updates have come. And even in Novak's gynecology, they have come with this figure that 20 or more follicles in either ovary measuring 2 to 9 millimeters in the diameter. All right. So we used to say 10 to 12. Now we must say more than 20 follicles in each ovary. All right. Not cumulative both the ovaries. And the volume of the ovary should be increased. So a volume more than 10 milliliters. And even if one ovary is having this picture, you don't have to say that both ovaries should have a PCO picture. You do the ultrasound, you see one ovary with these multiple follicles, she's a case of PCOS. All right. So this is uh, from one of my patients, which we saw just last week, and the classical picture of PCOS in both the ovary. All right. And you can see the uh, volume of the uh, right ovary is around this much. Uh, this is just the right ovary in two uh, different pictures. So the right ovary's volume is 16.6 cc. All right, let's move on and see what is required for us to say the diagnosis. Now, ever since uh, the Rotterdam uh, conference of 2003, we know that the criteria is anovulation along with hyperandrogenism. Now, hyperandrogenism can be clinically a hirsute girl or her blood picture is showing hyperandrogenism that is with uh, more uh, testosterone or circulating androgen levels. So either it's a clinical hyperandrogenism or a lab hyperandrogenism. Either way, it is fine. So anovulation hyperandrogenism with a ultrasound picture. Now, the ultrasound picture of PCOS, mind you, may not be seen in all the patients. Okay. And the PCO kind of look on the ovary can also be seen in 15% normal women. Let me revise for you. These are the three criteria. Any two of these three is enough for us to diagnose PCOS. But you will not see this PCOS picture on the ultrasonography in all the patients, number one. And 15% of all normal regular cycle women may have this PCO picture without having anything else. So don't just go by the absolute numbers. Okay, don't just go by saying that so many women have PCOS, so all women will have this on the ultrasonography. No, they may have any two of these three to be called PCOS. All right, so let's move on and tell you what are the four recognized phenotypes of PCOS. Just like I was telling you that ultrasound picture might not be there in all the patients. So there, there are four different phenotypes. So the uh, most common phenotype, the type 1 phenotype, which is seen in almost 70% of patients of PCOS is the one which has clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism. Can you see this? Hyperandrogenism clinically or biochemically evident. Then ovarian dysfunction, that is she's not ovulating and a PCOS morphology. So one, two, three, all of these three present together, that kind of PCO picture is seen in around 70% of patients. Now, type 2, that is there is hyperandrogenism and there is ovarian dysfunction. Type 3, again there is hyperandrogenism and a PCOS morphology. But yes, type 4 is that there is no hyperandrogenism but ovarian dysfunction and PCOS morphology. So these are the four recognized types of PCOS patients which we see and uh, most common being the type 1. Okay, so let's move on and see something else that most common cause of hirsutism. Since we're discussing about the clinical picture of PCOS, please remember there's a lot of confusion regarding hirsutism. I have repeatedly told you and I will revise it once again and for the people who are seeing me for the first time, please understand hirsutism. If you see a girl with hirsutism, she's PCOS. Please remember that. Even if you don't like to hear it, because I know a lot of your books keep saying that idiopathic hirsutism is the commonest. I'm so sorry, it is not. Read this book. This is Novak's Gynecology, and this is key points. Key points are given in the beginning of the book. So I'm quoting straight from a major book, the Bible of uh, Gynae Oncology and Endocrinology for us. This says the most common cause of hyperandrogenism and hirsutism is PCOS. All right. So if you remember this one reference, you should not have any, any problem in answering with confidence that hirsutism is equal to PCOS. So yes, once again, I'll tell you this, that of all the patients who have hirsutism, 25% patients are idiopathic. I know there's no cause of that hirsutism. Uh, she's, got a, she's got a hairy look, 
she's got uh, a prominent locks, she's got prominent eyebrows and she may have some acne and you may think that she may be having PCOS. No, she's got regular cycles. Her ultrasound picture does not suggest PCOS. She has no ovarian or adrenal tumors which are making androgens. So 25% of hirsutism actually is idiopathy. Now, of the remaining 75% patients who have hirsutism, PCOS is the commonest cause, all right? Of course, you must also rule out uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, you must rule out adrenal and ovarian tumors, Cushing syndrome, there's so many other causes of hirsutism, we all know. If you want to know something else, very important, most common cause of hirsutism, PCOS, no doubt. But always rule out congenital adrenal hyperplasia, the non-classic form which presents around the onset of puberty, please always rule out congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Now, again, there is no controversy in this. If somebody says no congenital adrenal hyperplasia is the most common cause, I'm so sorry, it is not. Almost one in six girls, some books say around 10%, some books say 15 to 20%. Yes, my book, No Axe Gynecology says 10% of women in the world are PCOS. Some books say 15 to 20% of women in the world are PCOS. So yes, I can easily say one in five to one in six girls, every fifth or sixth girl is PCOS. That's the kind of instance of PCOS. That's why I'm taking this topic for you because it's a short, short topic, which is going to come in your exams. So one in five to one in six girls are PCOS. That's the kind of instance we have. Now let's compare this with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. You know how much is that? Yes, it is one in 10,000. One in 10,000 to 15,000 girls is congenital adrenal hyperplasia. But yes, that's a more severe kind of, uh, you know, hirsutism. And that kind of hirsutism uh, is a little difficult to manage because Along with hirsutism, there is virilization, there is masculinization. What do I mean by that? That in congenital adrenal hyperplasia, a girl along with the male pattern baldness and acne will have uh, breast atrophy, she'll have uh, clatromegaly and she'll have hoarseness of voice. Now these three things are not reversible. If a girl has hoarseness of voice because of congenital hyperplasia, you may start the treatment of congenital hyperplasia, but you will not reverse the hoarseness. So these are permanent signs. So that's the difference between uh, PCOS and congenital hyperplasia. That congenital hyperplasia may present with permanent virilizing, masculinizing signs. All right. So let's move on and see that most common cause of hirsutism is PCOS. And remember. Hirsutism is not universal in PCOS. Not every woman with PCOS will have it. It can range from around 20% in the Japanese who have lesser 5 alpha reductase activity in the skin. You know, the skin will have the hair, body skin will have the hair, and the 5 alpha reductase activity determines the androgen content under the skin. So, Japanese have less of that activity, so they have lesser obvious hirsutism whereas if you go as far as the americans they have the highest amount of uh, has number of people who have hirsutism along with pcos why because they have more activity of the file for reductase all right so don't think that if uh, pco is there hirsutism has to happen no it can range from as low as 20 percent to as high as 70 percent all right so uh, this is the morphology which i was telling you about the pcos patient once more and uh, what is the syndrome of PCOS? Why is this uh, such a major problem that we keep discussing about this and keep asking the exams? Now, this patient presents you with what? She presents you with annulation because of which there will be infertility. She'll have oligomenorrhea, that is a cycle which is beyond 35 days. And if she's missing it for three months, we say it's amenorrhea. And uh, hirsutism, which is because of the hyperandrogenism, obesity associated with the insulin resistance. And what are the lab parameters which you must know in addition to the so many other small lab parameters is that the LH FSH ratio. Uh, well, let me just tell you, it increases to 3 is to 1. Normally, it is 1 is to 1. We'll come back to this, how all of this happens. That's the purpose of this class. And testosterone is increased. Sex hormone binding globulin is reduced. So the circulating androgens are bound to the sex hormone binding globulins. And if the sex hormone binding globulin production is not up to the androgen production amount. That is, the sex hormone binding globulin is not enough to bind to the circulating androgens. So whatever SSBG is there, it binds to the androgens, but androgen production is increased in PCOS. We'll discuss how. So that high 
amount of androgens will cause more free circulating androgens and causes hirsutism. And of course, serum insulin is increased. Let's see why all this happens and where all this happens. Okay. So, as compared to the normal patient which we saw, which had follicles which were small and then growing progressively increasing in size, let's see what happens in a case of PCOS. So, we discussed the very, very basic part about PCOS that it has multiple small follicles. Remember the punchline? Small follicles. And those small follicles, pearl size follicles, don't increase in size. Now, two to six millimeter size follicles which do not increase in size. Now, let's see what happens. So, the follicle is small, it stays small, and it does not increase in size. But what is the difference here? These are small follicles. They are not increasing in size, but they are multiple such small follicles. So, when they are multiple such small follicles, which are the antral size follicles or the preantral size follicles, these multiple small, not mature, please remember, they are not becoming the mature follicle. You know, what's a mature follicle which ruptured? We saw a follicle ruptures around 18 to 20 millimeters in size, isn't it? So that 20 millimeter size follicle is a mature follicle. This is a 2 to 6 millimeter size follicle or 8 or 9 millimeter size follicle. So it's an antral or a preantral size follicle. It is not growing in size. Now, if the follicle is not growing in size, it is still making some estrogen. Do not say that estrogen production will be there only in a mature follicle. That's where we get confused many times. So yes, there are multiple small follicles around 20 per ovary. Remember that? So that 20 follicle in each ovary will have these antral follicles will start making estrogen. All right. So the estrogen will go on progressively increasing. Can you see? It is increasing progressively. Now, as the follicle is, uh, as the estrogen is increasing from these small follicles, you know, the estrogen will start making the endometrium proliferate. Can you see? The endometrium will start, excuse me, endometrium will start growing in size like this. Endometrium will proliferate. Now, when the estradiol, when the estrogen amount in this woman reaches around 150 to 200 picogram, that's the same level which can happen in a single mature follicle. Now, there are multiple such follicles. They'll also make high amount of estradiol. So, when it reaches this critical level, of course, it goes even beyond that, isn't it? It's a hyperestrogenic state. PCOS is a state of high estrogens. Please remember, those of you think that PCOS have less estrogen, this is the picture. Please take a note of this picture. Remember, estrogens are progressively increasing in PCOS. Okay, so these estrogens are progressively increasing in amount because they're multiple small follicles and each small follicle is making estrogens. Estrogens are high. So as the estrogen reaches this critical level, 150, 200 micrograms, remember this high estrogen gives a feedback to the brain. It gives a feedback to the brain that yes, there is so much of estrogen in the body, send the LH. Remember, the same thing happened first picture we discussed that when there is enough amount of estrogen made in the follicle, it gives a feedback to the brain and it causes the LH surge. But the same estrogen is made now in this species woman with multiple small follicles. So the estrogen feedback will happen and that will cause the LH to increase. See, the LH is now increasing. This LH is progressively increasing. It has gone very high and that high LH should actually cause the patient's follicle to rupture. But what is the basic for the follicle to rupture? Follicle should be mature. This follicle is only around two to six millimeter size. It's not the 14, it's not the 18 to 20 millimeter size follicle, isn't it? So this follicle does not rupture. In fact, the high LH which is there, which will try to rupture the follicle, cannot rupture it, but it make it a little harder than the normal follicles. This follicles, instead of rupturing will actually become even harder because of this high LH. You know, what happens when the follicle is a big follicle, normal woman I'm talking now, a follicle is around 20 millimeters. It is a really distended follicle, 20 millimeter size. It has got an intrafollicular pressure. The walls have thinned out. So moment the LH comes, it grenades the follicle, follicle ruptures and oocyte goes out. Ovulation happens. It's a mini blast which happens in the woman's body. But in a PCOS woman, this blast doesn't happen because follicle is very size, intrafollicular pressure has not happened and the follicular fluids have not increased, there's no distension. 
and the LH cannot rupture these follicles. The follicle actually becomes hard. Now these follicles don't rupture. Now when they do not rupture, what will happen? Anovulation, infertility will happen when the follicles don't rupture. Okay. Now when the follicles have not ruptured, what hormone which forms after rupture of the follicle will not form now? Yes, you know after the rupture of the follicle, progesterones are made. But rupture has not happened. So see this progesterone in green. This progesterone is not increasing at all. Progesterone stays low. Now, when the progesterone stays low, what action on the endometrium does not happen? Endometrium proliferates because of estrogen. It becomes secretory with progesterone. We saw in the first diagram. Now, there is no secretion. The estrogen goes on increasing. It goes on proliferating the endometrium. Can you see? If you see, uh, see this. 0, 14, 28, 60, 90. 90 days have passed in this example. 3 months have passed in this example. And the follicles are not rupturing. Progesterone is not forming. And endometrium goes on proliferating. There is continuous proliferation. And there is proliferation for 90 days, 120 days sometimes. So 3 months, this woman is only proliferating. So that's why you have hyperplasia of the endometrium. The endometrium goes on increasing too much. Now, what happens? The high high estrogen cause a feedback to the brain to cause the LH to increase. LH should rupture the follicle. It has not happened. There is no progesterone. So there is no progesterone to give a feedback also to the LH. So LH stays high. Can you see? Normally the LH surge should happen something like this. Remember? LH surge. That way we say a surge. It just a peak and it comes down. The peak is just to rupture the follicle and go back. Now that is not happening in this woman. The progesterone is not formed at all. There is no feedback to the LH. So LH keeps staying high. And that high LH, persistent high LH, what does it do? Yes, it acts on the stroma. The LH acts on the stroma. Normally also LH acts on the stroma and that LH well, it acts on the normal ovarian stroma. It stimulates the theca cells to make the androgens. Yes, normally LH acts on the stroma to make the androgens. Now see this, the LH is through the roof here. There is so much LH in this patient. This LH will act on the stroma and that will make much more. More LH, more androgens. Alright, so now what do we see? We see hyperandrogenism causing hirsutism. And we already saw that there is anovulation causing infertility in this patient. Now, how did this woman have periods? Normally women have periods because the corpus luteum degenerates. When the corpus luteum degenerates, the progesterone reduces, and all women have progesterone withdrawal bleeding. What is the cause of bleeding? Progesterone withdrawal. Of course, majorly progesterone withdrawal. Also, the estrogen withdrawal is uh, responsible for the periods to start, but majorly it's the progesterone withdrawal. Now, progesterone withdrawal happens, menstrual blood comes out. This woman is not having progesterone to have progesterone withdrawal, isn't it? There is no progesterone to cause a withdrawal. So this woman is having only estrogens and the endometrium is growing so tall. Now one fine day, maybe the 45th day or the 60th day, sometimes 90th or the 120th day, that is three months or four months sometimes, the top of the glands, these top of the glands will start becoming ischemic. Look the blood supply goes from the base of the glands till the top of the glands. From the base till the top of the glands, the blood supply goes. Now, when the top of the glands are becoming so tall, see this is the uterus, see this is a uterine cavity. Where are the glands growing? This is not a tree in a park which is going on becoming taller, isn't it? It's a close space. So normally the endometrium grows this tall from both the sides and it become secretory in normal women. In this woman, the endometrium is constantly proliferating. See, in a PCOS woman, the endometrium is constantly proliferating. So the top of the glands here, I'll change the color to show you. The top of the glands here from both the sides will finally one day become ischemic and they will start coming out. So yes, a PCOS woman will have a ischemic withdrawal. They'll have a ischemic withdrawal. Normal women have a progesterone withdrawal. This woman has an ischemic withdrawal. Why is it ischemia? Well, you can't say estrogen is less. You can't say it's a 
estrogen withdrawal kind of thing it's a very high estrogen it's a very tall endometrium but the endometrium cannot grow any taller now isn't it it's in a packed uterus it's in a small cavity so the overcrowding of the glands cause the ischemia at the top of the glands and the top of the glands will finally become ischemic come out so that's why you call it a ischemic withdrawal the estrogen stay high it's not there's a estrogen withdrawal the estrogen stay high so the endometrium this becomes ischemic and it comes out and cause some bleeding after some days this part will get ischemic this will start bleeding after another few days this will become ischemic this will start bleeding now that's why a woman with PCOS has a lot of problem when she comes to you what does she come to you with those interns in this uh, class who are listening to me you would have seen so many girls who come to the opening say sir first I don't get my periods for let's say three months when I start getting my periods I bleed for four five days it stops after another three four days I start bleeding again then after another one week I start bleeding again so what is this sir I I have such bad cycles my roommate has such regular cycles I have such irregular cycles so moment she comes with irregular cycles i always keep telling you if she's having irregular cycles she's not ovulating always remember this basic any girl who's got regular cycles she's ovulating girl not having regular cycles and ovulatory now this is the outright basic 90 percent of the time it is correct that's enough for you there are exceptions to all the rules the basic rule is that they're all rules have exceptions i know that you people must be thinking of other causes but please remember if a woman is having regular cycles, she's ovulatory. If she's having irregular cycles, it is anovulatory. So yes, this woman is not ovulating. Endometrium is growing on, becoming tall and tall and it's becoming ischemic. And that ischemic endometrium will one fine day come out and start bleeding. But the bleeding might not just finish in three, four days. It will be a heavier bleeding for three, four days. She'll stop for some time, maybe a week. Then again, she'll start, she'll start bleeding. So that's why there is oligomenorrhea, amenorrhea, followed by a heavy withdrawal. So now this is what we see as the syndrome. Now let's see what happens in the lab parameters. What's the purpose of FSH? Remember the first slide I told you FSH is for estrogens. Estrogens you can see are increasing so much this red line. So look at the FSH. FSH is a low level here. Isn't it? High estrogen will give a feedback to the brain stop the FSH from coming. Now, what is the purpose of LH? LH purpose is progesterone. I have told you, remember these punch lines. FSH for estrogen, LH for progesterone. There is high estrogen. FSH is low, but there is no progesterone. So, when there is no progesterone, there is no feedback to the LH. And LH keeps on increasing. Remember, that LH acts on the stroma to cause hyperandrogenism. So, what is more and what is less? LH is very high. See this, LH is so high and progesterone is a low tonic level, a very basal minimal level of FSH is, is present in this room. So FSH is low, LH is high. So yes, the LH-FSH ratio, which is normally 1 is to 1, it becomes 3 is to 1. So yes, some books will say 2 is to 1, but the answer I want all of you to remember, the diagnostic is 3 is to 1. LH is 3 times the value of FSH. I know now some of you will you know have a doubt and you may say that so LH FSH ratio gets reversed in PCOS. Some of your books also keep saying that LH FSH ratio gets reversed. Well normally it is 1 is to 1 and in PCOS gets reversed and what happens it becomes 1 is to 1? Come on you know better than this. LH FSH ratio is 2 is to 1 or 3 is to 1 doesn't get reversed normally it is one is to one what will happen if it gets reversed all right so let's come out of all those uh, so many books which keep uh, giving you that information i think you must come back to the outright basics the answer which we are looking for you when we make mcqs for you we want you to say lhfs ratio is three is to one even if two is to one is there in the clinic i'm almost certain that she's a case of pcos all right now lhfs ratio is increased the androgens are increased sex hormone binding globulin cannot match up the liver cannot make so much of sex hormone binding globulin so the net result of this is that there is more free testosterone more free testosterone and yes now the crux of the situation is that all of this is explained by this one small fact what is that small fact small follicle please small follicle don't forget that part now let's quickly revise Small follicle, does not grow in size, does not ovulate, anovulation. 
Annihilation, infertility. Does not ovulate, does not make witch hormone, progesterone. No progesterone, no secretion of the endometrium. Endometrium grows on becoming tall and tall and it becomes finally ischemic because of the high estrogens. It grows very tall, it becomes ischemic like I am showing you here in this picture. And then finally, it becomes ischemic and sheds out. Delayed cycles. Now, when there is no ovulation, there is no progesterone, no feedback to the LH. LH goes on increasing, it acts on the stroma, causes more and more androgen production, hirsutism. All of that is based on just one small fact. What is that small fact? Small follicle. Again, small follicle, not ovulating, infertility. Annulator cycles are irregular. That's why delayed periods. No ovulation, no progesterone. So no feedback to LH, LH will be high, hirsutism. Simple. Just remember that small basic, small follicle. If you remember that, things are okay. Small follicle, not ovulating, infertility. Annulated cycles are irregular, we discussed that. When there is no ovulation, no progesterone, no feedback to the LH, LH will be high, hirsutism. Clear? Many times I can repeat this, I have the patients, some of you understood, might be getting bored here. But yes, it is for everybody here that we are having this class. And if you understand this, then the treatment part is so much more easier. Alright? Why does this all happen? Why does the follicle does not grow in size? Why is the follicle small? Is there a problem in the blood supply? Actually not. Everything is fine, but there is something called insulin resistance. We all know that if a follicle has to increase in size, the blood supply has to come from the ovarian artery and there is enough glucose in this ovarian artery, isn't it? And this glucose will be taken up into this ovary and the glucose will be required for the energy process which is required for a small follicle to have this RNA mediated DNA synthesis to make a follicle grow in size and the small follicle go on increasing bigger and bigger it becomes 18-20 millimeter in size and the LH acts and the rupture happens. This energy is required, glucose is required, energy is required everywhere in our body isn't it? We require energy, I require energy to speak here, to move my hands and to think everywhere glucose is required. Now how does the glucose get into the cell? Everywhere we know insulin is required for picking up the glucose moiety and taking it across the cell membrane. Apart from the brain and the RBCs, you guys know better than me about this and the GLUT1 and the two receptors. I'm not going to all of that. But the main purpose is to understand that glucose is up, uptaken anywhere in the body because of the insulin. Now, in PCOS, there is insulin resistance. Now, this is what you have to understand. When there is insulin resistance, see the glucose is present, but the uptake of glucose is not so well. So when there is lesser glucose available, when there is lesser glucose in this ovary, there are lesser, there is lesser growth of the follicle. And yes, bigger problem is that there are so many more follicles which can be genetically predetermined. There is some genetics also in this that there is a mother may have PCOS and the daughter may also later get PCOS, okay? So yes, there might be some predisposition to have many follicles utilizing the same amount of glucose which is less. That's why the follicles grow to a basic size and after that they stop growing and that's why they cause the small follicle. And from the small follicle you can pick up and go and understand this complete story of PCOS, isn't it? So we discussed that multiple number of times. Why does it happen? The basic is insulin resistance. Uh, if there is insulin resistance in the body, the insulin is not utilized, then what happens to the levels of insulin in the body? The circulating insulin levels will be high, isn't it? So yes, fastening insulin levels, another lab parameter, now you understand, since there is insulin resistance, the circulating levels of insulin will be high and that's why we do the fasting insulin levels and that high levels will tell us about. So generally it is Anything less than 20 million international units is a normal value. More than 25, think in terms of a PCOS patient. All right. So let's move on and see what else can be the cause of PCOS. They also say that the 17 hydroxylase, the CYP17 enzyme dysregulation happens. Now, this enzyme, the 17 hydroxylase, all of you know, if you remember the adrenal steroid genesis. Uh, I've always told you that those who don't have this uh, diagram, please take it, copy it, take a picture, whatever you want, please take this. 
because this is the adrenal steroidogenesis. And if you know the steroidogenesis, then there's so many things in endocrinology, in gynecology, pediatric surgery, pediatrics and skin, I mean dermatology, plastic surgery, so many of you specialties will require basic understanding of this, uh, you know, part of cholesterol breakdown in the adrenal glands must remember this. All right. So if we see that the cholesterol breaks down to uh, pregnenolone by the 2022 desmolase and then it makes pregnenolone and pregnenolone converts into progesterone. And then this pregnenolone is converted to 17 hydroxy pregnenolone by 17 hydroxylase and the progesterone is also converted to 17 hydroxy progesterone by the same 17 hydroxylase. Now if this enzyme is dysregulated, the central inhibition is lesser, this enzyme works over time and it makes more and more end products, namely the androgens. So this dysregulation is also uh, genetically predetermined and this is also contributory to the occurrence of PCOS. All right. So yes, let's try with all of this information, try and understand how we can take care of a woman with PCOS. So there are so many things which we have to take care of, namely anovulation, irregular cycles and hirsutism. There are three different aspects of PCOS. Uh, don't come and ask me, sir, what is the drug of choice of PCOS? Please don't even start writing that because if you ask me PCOS, there are so many things, you know, it's taken uh, al almost one hour of discussions now and we are still not uh, having a complete, you know, all round understanding of PCOS because this is a very, very big problem. PCOS happens to so many women and it has got so many facets of discussion. We are just trying to tell you outright clinical basics which you can use in your exams and in your practice. Otherwise, even today I've learned a few more things when I was coming for your class about PCOS. Every day something new is coming about PCOS. So let's stick to the basics and try and understand what are the three things which you want to take care of? Ovulation, irregular cycles, hirsutism. Now you can't say there is one drug which takes care of all of these. So don't tell me drug of choice of PCOS is uh, clonconcentrate or metformin or letrozole. To the specific problem, what is the best drug? Maybe that you can ask me. But overall, don't say PCOS, what is the drug of choice? And don't even expect that PCOS will be cured. Even before I start telling you about anything in PCOS management, don't think that, okay, what is the, uh, what happens after the woman who conceives with PCOS and after that she delivers, what happens? Does PCOS get all right? PCOS will stay. Hello? PCOS will stay all uh, lifelong. Yes, maybe the problems will be lesser because menopause happens a little earlier in PCOS women because more follicles are used every cycle remember most women have around six to seven andro follicles and one will ovulate this one will have around 20 odd follicles in one ovary other ovary 20 odd follicles so she'll get into menopause a little earlier but whenever that menopause happens till then she will be a case of PCOS all right so don't think that you have got one mantra which you can apply to all PCOS women it requires a lot of counseling to sit in the opening and take care of PCOS women just as much I'm taking to make you people understand all right so ovulation induction drugs we can use for induction of ovulation the drugs which we have are the letrozole clomphene citrate tamoxifen metformin helps We'll discuss about that because uh, the basically the problem is there is insulin resistance so some of the obese women you know the normal weight pieces that also ex ex exists all right the normal women normal weight women who can have pcos now those women metformin may not be the best option for the obese women metformin will be a better option Again, no hard and fast rules, but metformin will make the circulating insulin more sensitive to the end organs, isn't it? We know that. So that's the best part about metformin. It doesn't cause hypoglycemia. Even if you want to give it to adaptic, the best thing about metformin is it may cause side effects, but it does not cause effects of hypoglycemia because whatever level it, the sugar should come down, it brings it to that. So it increases the insulin sensitivity. We're using it for help in ovulation, but the drugs which we generally use are letrozole, clomiphene, and tamoxifen. Now the injectables which I use are the gonadotropins. And um, what are the gonadotropins we discussed? Yes, the gonadotropins are the drugs, are the agents which act on the gonads. So the pituitary releases the gonadotropins, things which act on the gonads and have tropic effect on the gonads. So gonadotropins, LH and FSH are gonadotropins. So you can make them from uh, the urine of postmenopausal women. Why? Because menopausal women will have high LH and high FSH, remember? Because the ovaries are not working in menopause, so high LH and FSH. That high LH and FSH comes out into the urine of these women. 
we collect the urine of these women and from that urine we fractionate this LH and FSH and make it into small powder form, mix it with some saline and give it as injections to PCOS women. Yes, basically a lot of investment in urine and you have gonadotropins, very expensive. One injection is sold for around 1200 rupees or you can make them recombinant, all right? Yes, recombinant uh, FSH, recombinant LH is the in thing these days, far more expensive than the urinary product. And um, they're even better because recombinant technology will give you the stra same strength of FSH every time in every batch. Urinary the levels will change, you know, the amount of LH and FSH coming out of a very big batch of uh, urine, basically, the amount of FSH and LH in one injection might vary. That's where the recombinant drugs are in these days. So injectables like the recombinant FSH and LH, urinary LH and FSH, and then you can also give the recombinant GNRH in loads, which could be agonists or antagonists. All right. So uh, these are the basic drugs of ovulation induction. Let's see how they work. Um, same diagram again, which I showed in the beginning of the class, that hypothalamus will act on the pituitary, makes FSH and LH, and same thing. Basically, follicle is growing, making estrogen, follicle rupture is making progesterone, and proliferation secretion. All right. Now, let us see one drug which you know very well. Let us see clomiphene citrate here. Where does clomiphene citrate work? Now, many of your books will confuse you and say that it works at all the levels. MCQ asked names many times, couple of times in all India exam. What is the main action of clomiphene citrate? You know, it's a racemic mixture. Pharmacology people have read that very well. But the basic is that it inhibits the estrogenic receptors in the hypothalamus. All right. Hypothalamic estrogenic receptors is the answer which I want you to remember. So, yes. Hypothalamus acts on the pituitary to make the follicle and the follicle makes estrogen to make the endometrium proliferate and this gives a feedback to the brain, a negative feedback to the brain for the FSH. It tells the brain that you reduce the FSH. FSH for estrogen. Remember that punchline? FSH for estrogen. Now, you push in clomphene citrate now. Clomphene citrate stops this feedback. It blocked this feedback to the brain. So the brain thinks that there is no estrogen in the body. So when there is no estrogen in the body, what will the brain increase? Yes, FSH is for estrogen. Now, when the estrogen is not coming, brain gets a message, okay, fine, there's a block. The clomphene citrate has come here. It has blocked the estrogen feedback. Brain thinks there's no estrogen. It starts stimulating the pituitary, increases the FSH. Moment the FSH increases, moment the FSH increases in a PC ovary, the follicle will start becoming bigger. Maybe two follicles will start becoming bigger. And once the follicles start becoming bigger, you know, bigger follicles will rupture. 18, 20 millimeters, the follicles will rupture. So yes, you fool the brain. Tell the brain there is no estrogen because PCOS is a hyper estrogenic condition. Brain co, there is no problem. Brain is very happy that there is so much estrogen, I don't have to send the FSH. You block the feedback to the brain, and now when there is no feedback to the brain of estrogen, FSH will increase, ovulation will happen. All right. So this is given in the beginning. You tell me when you want to give this drug. Now you tell me. FSH, when is it high? We discussed in the first uh, slide that FSH is high in the initial 2-3 days. So give the clomiphene citrate in the initial 2-3 days. Yes, from the second day to the sixth day of the menstrual cycle for these five days, second, third, fourth and fifth and sixth day. These five days I give the uh, clomphene citrate and that increases the FSH at that time. So the follicles start increasing. I'll start doing the ultrasound monitoring to see if the follicle is growing. The day the follicle is ready, I tell the couple to have uh, a coitus, a sexual relation. With that, pregnancy chance increases. Oh, how much does it increase to? Another MCQ. Ovulation can happen around 80% of times. Pregnancy can happen 40% of times. Classical answer, 70 to 80%. A lot of books say ovulation is 80% and pregnancy is around 40% with clomphene citrate. So yes, one of the most uh, exciting discoveries and very commonly used drug, clomphene citrate. But we have another method now. Another method is that in the periphery, you know, in the periphery, there is conversion of the androgens to estrogens. 
and those estrogens also contribute to the net amount of estrogen in the body although the estrogen there is not estradiol it is estrogen we know that isn't it but yes this conversion also happens in the ovary so it's not that it acts only in the periphery it acts in the ovary it acts in the periphery but in the periphery as a there is more conversion of making estrogen and in the ovaries it is estradiol all right now this drug called letrozole it is a aromatase inhibitor normally the androgens the androstenedione converts to estradiol by the aromatase enzyme now you put in a aromatase inhibitor known as letrozole this letrozole when it inhibits the formation of estradiol net amount of estrogen will reduce ovarian and peripheral estrogen will reduce when the estrogen reduces in the body remember same principle FSH for estrogen, LH for progesterone. Don't forget those two. I know those two punchlines, I'll be using them ad nauseum every time, wherever you meet me. So that FSH will start stimulating the ovary once again. Why? Because there is no estrogen in the body. You have fooled the brain once again. The estrogen feedback will reduce. Brain thinks there is lesser estrogen because you reduce the production of estrogens from conversion of androgens to estrogens. But yes, that conversion when it stops, it gives a feedback to the brain and the brain thinks there is no estrogen. It starts increasing the FSH again and the follicles will start growing again. But the question you people have always asked me, PCOS is a case of hirsutism. You are giving a aromatase enzyme inhibitor and the androgens will not convert to estradiol and the circulating androgens will increase and it will cause more hirsutism. Oh, hello. We are giving it only for the second to the sixth day of the cycle again you're not giving it for a very long time follicular stimulation is given three times to maximum six times most reproductive medicine centers like mine we give it three cycles or six cycles in a lifetime if it doesn't work we go for IVF, isn't it so in these three months or even six months you're giving androgen Inhibition of androgen production, uh, androgen conversion to estrogen, we're giving it only for five days in a month. That will never cause hirsutism. So don't worry about letrozole causing hirsutism. It's a very temporary rise of number, uh, the level of androgens, not a permanent rise. Okay. So yes, this conversion is inhibited. Estradiol is less and feedback to the brain is given that there is less estrogen. So FSH increase, ovulation happens. Now, we've understood this well. You can also give drugs which we discussed that we had this urinary and recombinant FSH. So some of you may think, sir, why do you want to give a drug which inhibits the conversion or why do you want to give a drug which inhibits the feedback to the brain like clomphenicitrate? Why don't we just give what is increasing? What is increasing with all these two drugs? Clomphenicitrate and letrozole. What increases eventually? We increase the FSH. So why can't you give recombinant FSH? Why can't you give urinary FSH? So yes, injections of human menopausal gonadotropin have FSH and LH. Recombinant FSH, both of these can be given for direct stimulation of the ovary rather than banking on all this feedback inhibition mechanisms. All right. So that's about the ovulation induction. Now, letrozole versus clomphenicitrate. That's the next question. I'm sure all of you are running this in your brains already. Letrozole has better live birth rates and lesser multiple pregnancies. Clomphenicitrate has almost 8 to 10 percent of multiples and this is much lesser in this. You know, all of you are happy getting twins, isn't it? All of you here uh, twins in somebody in your family, oh, you're very happy. But sometimes you get triplets, you get quadruplets. You don't want that because anything more than twins is a complication of infertility management. Three or four, five is a complication of IVF or infertility management. So you don't want anything more than twins. In fact, twins also a lot of people say, sir, we already have a child and this she was not conceiving and we've been treating her for five years. Now you're having twins. So who's going to have, who's going to keep three children? Sometimes even twins is not what is required. So multiple birth rates are lesser in letrozole, like birth rates are better and the endometrium. Now this is a very, very important part. Why? Because clomphenicitrate, you know, it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It is estrogenic at some places. It is anti-estrogenic at some places. So yes, the anti-estrogenic action, the anti-estrogenic action on the uterine lining, on the endometrium, 
may sometimes give you a very thin endometrium. You have a follicle which is growing, it has become mature, oocyte has come out, ovulation has happened, the oocyte comes, it gets fertilized by the sperm, it comes for an implantation on a very thin 3 mm, 4 mm endometrium. It will never implant. For implantation, the endometrium should be at least more than 7, it should be at least 10 to 12 millimeters, and that will give a good secretory endometrium later on. But this endometrium is very thin. So that's why clomiphosite rate has this pregnancy rate much lesser. Ovulation rate, remember 80%, pregnancy rate 40% because there is a thinner endometrium in this patient. That's why letrozole is better. It does not have any anti isonic action. Better cervical mucus if there is letrozole given and not any fancy procedure like intrauterine insemination, nothing else is done. You just give letrozole and tell the couple to have uh, intercourse around the mid cycle. Cervical mucus hindrance to the sperm transport is also lesser in letrozole. Abortions are lesser and very, very important. Ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. That's very simple. More follicles, more estrogen, more ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Very simple. You know, the most common drug which causes this ovarian hyperstimulation is clomiphen because it's used most commonly, isn't it? It's used most commonly, I'm telling you. Please mark my words. We'll discuss what is the drug of choice. So it's used very commonly. That's why it has a lot of cases of OHSs. But yes, letrozole will not have multiple follicles. So that's why OHSs is much lesser. And let's go on to see some recent evidence. 2018, modification 2019 and 2020. The International Evidence-Based Guideline for the Assessment and Management of PCOS. Everybody have come to this conclusion. The ESHRI 2018 conference in Barcelona, I was uh, part of that conference. I had gone and presented something there. Of course, PCO's lecture was the lectures were the most exciting lectures for all infertility specialists. Then these criteria were modified in 2020 January. What you people have to understand? See, guidelines are so many. The British guidelines, American guidelines, there's so many guidelines in this world. For you people, guidelines are not very important. I am not saying do not listen to guidelines, but every day new guidelines will come. And for PG entrance, you don't have to know all the guidelines. But this was major. This was so major that overnight, all of us got the, uh, you know, got the information from the governing bodies of this. This is European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology. This is one of the major bodies. Another one is the uh, American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Now, these are the ones which govern the practice of infertility management and they came with these guidelines that if both oligoanovulation and hyperandrogenum were present, the ultrasound examination is not needed for the diagnosis of PCOS. If two things are present, ultrasound picture is present or not, doesn't matter. The other major recommendation which came, this is why this update was taken for you, that Combined low dose oral contraceptives are recommended treatment for menstrual irregularity. We'll come to that menstrual irregularity, how we can make a woman have regular cycles. So OCPs are recommended for menstrual regularity. That's one recommendation. Metformin for management of metabolic features, especially obese women. We discussed that already. And letrozole, see this line, letrozole has won the battle for the first line treatment of PCOS associated infertility. It is as simple as this, letrozole has won the battle. These are the final recommendations and modified in 2020 January and we are not changing from this. So those who still feel that clomphenicitrate is the drug of choice or the first line drug, please, we now know that the drug of choice is letrozole. All right. Please do not get any more get into any more discussion with anybody else because even as recent as day before yesterday I was in an exam for the infertility society and we were taking exams for the fellowships and we had some 20 odd students and everybody was repeating the same study ad nauseum that yes the first drug for ovulation induction for PCOS is letrozole. all right you can start if you want to know I told you second to the sixth day of the menstrual cycle 2.5 milligrams to 5 milligram dose can be given. All right. Uh, Clomphenicitate, I didn't tell you the dose. It starts by 50 milligrams. I would always start at 100, but yes, starting dose is 50 milligrams. 50 to 200 milligrams, you can go 
some people like me go up to 250 milligrams also but a good dosage range is 50 to 200 milligrams of clonconcentrate mind you not the drug of choice anymore it's an excellent drug i still use it but i would first go and give letosol because of the obvious benefits which i discussed with you previously all right now the other issues of pcos we discussed about the ovulation part now how do you give a woman regular cycles so we always discussed anulative cycles a patient is not having regular bleeding so how do you give a regular bleeding you can give a clonconcentrate it make a follicle grow and if she doesn't have sexual intercourse the follicle will rupture endometrium will become secretory and the endometrium will shed and have periods so that is giving ovulation induction and that kind of clonconcentrate usage has its own problems remember clonconcentrate has so many side effects so that's why we come to a very very basic principle if the cycle is irregular we can regularize it by giving ocps so combined oral concept pills please read the lecture please go and see the video lecture on combined oral concept pills on prep ladder it is a very uh, important lecture in fact i've started the menstrual physiology first and then immediately after menstrual, uh, menstrual physiology the first chapter is ohss and the next chapter is the combined oral concept pills you will understand why i do this kind of teaching because you understand the menstrual physiology then to understand the combined oral concept pills it's a very easy way to understand it'll take three four hours of uh, you know constant concentration but once you understand that it will be very easy so combined oral concept pills will give regular cycles you give her a totally artificial cycle the cycle is under your control or you can give progesterone half in the later half of the cycle so let me explain ocps gives a totally artificial cycle what about this second progesterone support in the later half of the cycle you know the endometrium is constantly proliferating okay this is zero day 14 day and the 28th day you know the endometrium is constantly proliferating in a case of pcos there is no secretory activity so why there's no secretion there's no ovulation so you give progesterone from outside to make the endometrium secretory when does she have ovulation 14th day normally so i give the progesterone from the 14th day make the endometrium secretory how long does the copsidum work 10 days so i give for 10 days i give progesterone tablets just for 10 days at the 14 day onwards so from 14 to 24th you give the progesterone and you stop progesterone withdrawal happens and she gets periods or i can become even smarter rather than giving it for 10 days i give it from the 20th day of the menstrual cycle till the 24th day just for five days just five days of progesterone with this five days of progesterone, I make the endometrium secretory in the later half of the month. I give it for five days. Progesterone makes the endometrium secretory. Now I stop it. She gets a period. So just five days every month, I tell her that you take it for five days, you stop, periods will come. So when did your period come? So it came on uh, 30th of July. Okay. So next month again, from the 20th of August, another five days you take. 28th to 25th, 24th, 25th, you take the tablet and you stop. By 30th, you'll get periods again. Again, 20th of September, you take it. 20th of October, you take it. Take it for five days, stop, periods. My favorite management of PCOS for regular cycles. See, I'm very, very clear on this. Drug of choice for ovulation reduction already over. Regular cycles, best method, easy method don't have to make a remind she might not be very uh, educated sometimes she might have a patient from the village and she might be a person who's having difficulty understanding all these protocols so give her ocp simple you have directions on the ocp pill isn't it start from the day one and continue for 21 days last seven days there is a inert tablet called the ferrous sulfate take this when you stop uh, when the black tablet start your periods will, st uh, will start sometimes that time and when this black tablet stops start the new packet so she keeps taking that way she keeps getting regular cycles so ocps is the method of choice for giving regular cycles no doubt about that you have a smarter patient who understands what you're talking tell her that when your periods come next month 10 days before that like i told you in this example 30th of uh, july so next time 20th of august she takes the, the tablet four days of uh, five days of progesterone stop she gets periods so yes the best method for regular cycles is combined oral concept pills already given you in the recommendations the 2018 ESH recommendations I told you. Now, hirsutism, give antiandrogens. 
It can be spanlactone, finasteride, flutamide, ciprotron acetate, individual mechanisms, you know, but often they ask you, what is the first management? What is the best drug or the first drug you start in the management of hirsutism? Now, the first drug for hirsutism management is the spanlactone, simple answer. Hyperandrogenism, first drug, spanlactone. But now, you will ask me another question which is there in the exams and it is there in all the forums where I'm answering questions. Sir, she's a girl with PCOS. Her only problem is not hirsutism. She wants hirsutism management. She also wants regular cycles. What is the drug you want to give? So that's why I've already made these arrows. She wants treatment of irregular cycles. She wants treatment of hirsutism together. So what can you do? A combined oral concept pill again is not a bad answer. The first line management of irregular cycles with hirsutism management, a combined oral concept pills will give regular cycles. Will also reduce the LH. Remember, the patient has in combined oral concept pills has progesterones. It'll reduce the LH feedback. LH for progesterones. Remember, so LH will reduce, androgen production will reduce. Hirsutism becomes better with just plain OCPs. Eastern progesterone combination, seven eight months. Hirsutism will become much lesser. You want to be much smarter, what you can do? You can give a combined pill along with a drug like ciprotron acetate. You can also try drospirinone. Now, these are the new exciting drugs. They have asked you this question. What are the drugs which you can give for giving regular cycles in PCOS along with acne management? You know, acne is part of hirsutism. So when they ask you that question, let's not get confused. Regular cycles, ocipils. Hirsutism, spironolactone. Regular cycles and hirsutism together, ocipils are enough. But they've asked you a fourth question. If a patient has irregular cycles, this question came in so many exams, isn't it? Plus she has acne management required. What I want to give? Now in that case, I'll say a combined concept of pill along with ciprotiron acetate or drospirinone. You must have heard of these drugs called, commercially available drug called Yasmin, uh, Jeanette, Diane. They are various combination of drugs which are combining the uh, combined pill with the uh, uh, anti androgenic type of progesterone. Okay. So these are the other issues which can be used to settle. So we discussed about the annulation, we discussed about regular cycles and we discussed about the hirsutism. All right. Something which is uh, recently been asked for the last two, three years, I'm seeing this question that what do you do? Nothing works. You have tried uh, ovulation induction with uh, letrozole, clomphenicitrate. You tried injections, human menopausal gonadotropin, FSH. The ovary is totally, totally resistant because sometimes this stroma, can you see this trauma? This trauma, this all, all of this gray thing is actually the stroma. You know, I'm not drawing it like that. This whole of this gray thing is the stroma of the ovary. Okay. This stroma of the ovary has so much of androgens that the local androgens, I did not say this part earlier because it's too much too, too fast. That's why I did not tell it earlier. Too much of local androgens within the ovary, it's called a local factor. Too much of local androgens within the ovary and stroma will make these follicles very very hard they will become non-responsive to the clomphen or the fsh injections or the urinary fsh injections they cannot act them because there is so much of androgens over them making these follicles non-responsive so how can we reduce the local androgens surgically we can reduce that what is that procedure surgically we can put in an electrical probe we can do it laparoscopically we can put in a trocar or five millimeter trocar on the side and so that we can put in a cautery with that cautery you know i'm trying to make this uh, red arrow look like that this cautery this will release a lot of electrical energy this electrical energy will burn this much of over in stroma so this yellow is not a follicle do not get confused okay i made multiple small follicles earlier something like that but this is what i made on the powerpoint just to make you understand that i'm burning the stroma now see i'm burning the stroma here also and then i'm burning the stroma here so when you burn the stroma 
the local stroma reduces, the local androgen production reduces. Right, let me show that more convincingly to you, all right? Let's see here. See this? I'm punched in the ovary. This is uh, one of the videos which we made uh, for you students. See, we are punched in the ovary with the electrical cautery. And when we are burning the stroma, you know, you puncture the ovary and then we go inside, we burn the stroma. So when we are burning the stroma, the local milieu becomes lesser androgenic. Later, she might become so good that she may actually ovulate without any help from us. She may spontaneously ovulate, but that's around 20, 25, maximum 30% spontaneous ovulation is known to occur after laparoscopic over and drilling. But the ones who do not ovulate even after laparoscopic over and drilling spontaneously they don't ovulate. I have my clomphene citrate and my letrozole and HMG. These women will start acting very much better and responding very much better to my laparoscopic ovarian drilling. After that, they'll respond to my drugs much better. All right. So please remember, laparoscopic ovarian drilling is the surgical treatment which is done earlier. They would not do a drilling. They would just cut a wedge. They might cut so much of ovarian tissue. They used to call it the wedge resection. A lot of people actually still do it, but wedge resection caused a lot of fibrosis. It caused a lot of fibrosis, it caused a lot of adhesion. So that's why it's not the best method. Laparoscopic ovarian drilling is the surgical method of choice. See, wedge resection is also the same. You cut this much of ovarian tissue and throw it off. So when you take out a wedge of ovarian tissue, this much ovarian tissue goes out. Wedge, like, like a wedge. I mean, uh, how do I explain that to you? If there's an ovary, you cut this much of ovarian tissue. So now you have a wedge like this, see? There's a wedge of tissue, this much of tissue you've removed, okay? Like a pizza slice you take out, isn't it? Don't we say that, give me a wedge of your pizza, isn't it? So that wedge is taken out, this much of wedge is taken out. Now the remaining ovary will have less anemic trauma. But this had a lot of uh, surgical uh, side effects of fibrosis and adhesions. So that's why the laparoscopic ovary drilling is the better process, okay? So we've done with this and let's see. And this is the picture of one of the ovaries which I had done. This patient was having a very high uh, follicle count. So generally, generally for most people who do six holes per ovary. This is slightly more, this is almost eight. Uh, but this is not official, all right? Don't quote me. Go with six, all right? This patient, the picture which I had in my, you know, in my mobile phone while I was coming was one with eight. So we do that sometimes, but that's unofficial, okay? So let's not do that. So what are the updates? In addition to all of these drugs which I had discussed with you, lifestyle recommendations of women with PCOS, of healthy eating and regular physical exercise. Please remember that weight loss by 5% to 10%. 5% is what is immediate requirement. 10% is desirable. So if a woman is, uh, let's say 80 kgs and she comes down to 72, she will start spontaneously ovulating. That's what has been seen with PCOS. 10% weight reduction is what I would, but 5% is also effective. Healthy eating and regular physical activity, maintenance of healthy weight to improve overall health. And that's the 5 to 10% weight goal, which I was telling you. But the last line is even more important. Yes, what's the last line? Adherence to the lifestyle interventions. What has been taught, please remember, so much of discussion, I'm, I'm not joking here. Whatever I've told you people, a compressed summary of that without the minute details of LH and FSH, I actually do this with my PCOS patients because PCOS is a lifelong problem and young girls, 19 year old girls, when they come to me and I have to discuss with them about regular cycles, acne, and I have to tell the mothers that yes, keep her thin because later in life, when she's gonna get into planning a family, she's going to have a problem in ovulation and she's going to have a problem in conceiving. So she may actually come back to me. This happens. I have so many young girls who are my patients. Now they are women who are married and they are my patients. But since you counsel them well, they manage themselves better. They stick to the weight loss. They listen to advice of ovulation reduction. They have children. They have children with our treatment, but they go back to the regular cycles. So they must come back to me after having the deliveries. They must come back to me for OCP management or a last five days progesterone management like I told you, all right? So it's an ongoing thing. PCO is not like I told you, there's not something like I give this drug and she's taken care of. You know, it's not like that. It's a lot of counseling, much like I'm teaching you today here, all right? So remember all of this 
And one thing which I want to tell you before I wind up this lecture, that is metabolic syndrome diagnostic criteria. PCOS women are on a high probability of having endometrial cancer, you know, because of the high proliferation of the endometrial lining. They have a high chance of diabetes mellitus type 2 because of the insulin resistance. And they also have a high chance of having ovarian cancers. But in addition to all of that, coronary artery disease. Now, what is the problem? Why are they more prone to the coronary artery disease, the dysmetabolic syndrome X or the metabolic syndrome? That women who have a female uh, with the waist of uh, more than 35 inches, a uh, triglyceride level of more than 150, HD less than 50, blood pressure more than 130 by 85 millimeters of mercury, or a, uh, you know a fasting glucose between 110 to 126, or you can have a GTT which is altered. Any three of these five, one, two, three, four, five any three of these five will put her into the metabolic syndrome category and these women have a much higher chance of coronary artery disease also so that's what you must be telling them and it's very important that if they understand this then the uh, adherence to the lifestyle modification which i was telling you will be much better and there'll be lesser cases of coronary artery disease all right now don't think that all women who have uh, uh, pcos will eventually become diabetic you know they will have more chance of becoming diabetic converse also don't think that way that all women who are diabetic were pcos before no please diabetes is a summit you know diabetes is a summit is a top of a, a big uh, mountain there are many roads to that uh, top all right you can have insulin dependent diabetes you can have non-insulin dependent diabetes you can have you know destruction of the pancreas injuries to the pancreas infection to the pancreas whatever and you can have pcos to reach that summit remember men also have diabetes all right and they don't have pcos so don't think that all diabetes is because of PCOS. No, most women who are diabetic don't actually have PCOS before. PCOS may be related, but it's not a necessity for diabetes. All right. So I hope you remember all these facts, and uh, I think that's all I wanted to tell you. It's a slightly longish class, but PCOS will require that kind of discussion and uh, repetitive, uh, you know, reinforcement of the facts which I have told you. All right. So I hope you understood all of this well, and thank you so much for your patient hearing. And um, I think I can take some questions. Uh, team, if you can help me, uh, I can see some questions. Anybody who is uh, yes, um, can you show me the slide for questions? Give me a minute. I think I think I'll, I have to send them a reminder. Hello. Right. So I have uh, what uh, some of the questions and uh, okay. So obesity causes insulin resistance. Yay. So with us, thank you for your comments. Acanthosis mm. nigricans. Yes, I think I should tell you something about that also. I'll take us relatively. So yes, uh, we uh, in our discussions about the syndrome and uh, we discussed that uh, there might be insulin resistance. So along with insulin resistance, you can clinically see this insulin resistance and a cutaneous marker of insulin resistance is the acanthosis nigricans. Acanthosis nigricans is the clinical marker of insulin resistance. So yes, on the nape of the neck, the axilla, cubital fossae and the uh, popliteal fossa, they are the places where you'll see a person growing, you'll see a person having those dark, uh, dark velvety 
crural deposits, crural, crural areas, the flexural areas will have these deposits. So acanthosis nigricans along with insulin resistance and hyperandrogenism. Okay, hyperandrogenism, insulin resistance, acanthosis nigricans. Hair and syndrome, hair and syndrome, hyperandrogenism, insulin resistance and acanthosis nigricans can be seen in a lot of patients with PCOS. All right. Uh, congenital lateral hyperplasia have dealt with and uh, which enzyme deficiency Aditya has asked me 21 hydroxylase deficiency is the most common uh, enzyme which is associated with congenital lateral hyperplasia uh, just a minute I'll try to get a clean slide Okay, so congenital lateral hyperplasia, most common deficiency is the 21 hydroxylase deficiency. Yes, it can also happen because of uh, 11 hydroxylase deficiency, the second most common cause, and it can also happen because of 17 hydroxylase deficiency. Congenital lateral hyperplasia can be many times. The most common type which we've discussed is the 21 hydroxylase deficiency. All right. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Certain gentleman called Inesh promote diet. Yes, uh, promote the the diet is uh, very much part of the dietitian uh, who is going to discuss with this. But yes, diet management for PCOS is definitely the first management which I'll tell in the opening because I told that five ten percent weight reduction should be there. All right. Uh, Do not the, uh, the don't the small follicles destroy ever? Yes, they finally phase out because uh, when the small follicles are present and they are not ovulating, they will eventually undergo atresia, isn't it? Apoptosis will happen. So those twenty odd follicles which are present, these twenty odd follicles will not ovulate. They'll eventually go under go into atresia. The other follicles will start growing you know some the other pre antral and antral follicles will start growing so you actually don't see that you know you'll see these are shrinking and few will shrink and few will start coming again so you they don't you don't see actually a ruptured follicle you just see that two or three follicles would have gone away and new follicles would have replaced them they'll be again small size follicles all right the picture is almost constant but the follicles are being replaced constantly Annulation treatment I've discussed. Thank you, Dia. Uh, first drug is letrozole. Yes. Alia Ansari. Thank you. Lupo. Thank you. Abhishek, thank you so much for your remarks. Lupo, thank you. Uh, not many questions now. I have pieces since 12 years. Thin PCOS. Yes, uh, I'm not reading the name of the doctor. Uh, oh, yeah, thank you. I think this is slightly bigger, very small font in that one. So, a uh, lady with, um, I think, probably a student with uh, thin PCOS has written to me that, uh, you know, it is incurable kind of PCOS. No. PCOS itself is not curable, I told you. We can make you symptomatically better with the ways which I've told you. So don't think that uh, thin PCOS is something which we cannot treat. Even, uh, uh, you know, obese PCOS is difficult to manage. But if you go by the guidelines which I've given you, yes, a thin PCO lady may not require metformin. But ovulation induction protocols, giving regular cycles protocol, 
and please we don't say diet for those thin patients uh, yes there are patients who are not between uh, you know they are less than 20 bmi 18 16 bmi girls have pcos these days so yes classical pcos fat girl with irregular cycles and hirsutism yes that's classical but then we have women who have lesser weight don't think it is not uh, manageable curable yes that is debatable but manageable definitely you can be managed with all the principles which i told you please don't lose heart thin pcos do extremely well we have patients with uh, who have thin pcos they've many of them had uh, normal lives they've had pregnancies when they've had presentations with infertility please don't lose heart okay um Any complications of laparoscopic surgery? Wait a minute. Uh, I think I'm missing some questions. Uh, I'm not reading the lady's name. One day before, uh, did all sound so the pieces got married in uh, conceptives? Did you see in? and the ovary is healthy yeah sometimes uh, one doctor is saying that she had pcos and after marriage when uh, ultrasound was done the ovary was told that it is not having any more pcos now that's not cure of pcos it is just that somebody diagnosed you pcos wrongly because a lot of problem is about over diagnosis of pcos because anybody coming with any regular cycle people are thinking you have pcos Anovulation can happen because of hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, hyperprolactinemia. There's so many other causes of anovulation. So if there is anovulation, it does not mean that it is always PCOS. And yes, ultrasound picture of PCOS is not alone enough for diagnosing PCOS. I've told this even earlier. 15% women in the world who are normal, 15% of those women have PCOS look on the ovary. So, you know, I have so many young students like you come to me and say, sir, I've been diagnosed with PCOS. So I said, when was your period? So my period is always on the 5th. So I said, you're not PCOS. You're having regular cycles. It rules out anovulation most of the times. So if you're having regular cycles, you're not PCOS. So whoever has told you that is wrong. Just because the ultrasound shows PCOS, it's not enough. Sometimes the ultrasound picture is actually just showing two, three follicles. The radiologist says it's PCOS. So there's a lot of overdiagnosis of PCOS, and that's what this particular doctor who wrote to me is. I'm sure you're having that problem. All right. So it's good. Good. You don't have the uh, problem of PCOS. I'm happy with that. Uh, anyway. And um, side effect of OCPs uh, if taken regularly, yes, uh, that's a very good question, Radhika. Because when somebody is having OCPs regularly, they can be the long-term side effects. But remember, the OCPs class, I would have told you that OCPs actually have more benefits than side effects. The rare side effects of having CA cervix adenocarcinoma is actually just a theoretical documentation. And mind you, since you asked me, OCPs do not prevent breast cancer but they do not cause breast cancer go ahead and see Novak's gynecology see Williams obstetrics in the chapter of conception both have written categorically there are reports that some OCP studies which may actually increases the case of CA breast but it is not a well documented finding it is not conclusive finding we all can now only say that OCPs do not reduce the incidence of C breast, but it definitely does not increase the incidence of C breast. I know I'm contradicting a lot of people here, but then that's what the big books write. See, what is given in journals is none of your business. I'm repeatedly saying that. What is given in books, big books make your questions. Okay. What is there in research? There might be so many new things in research which might be happening and you will get thoroughly confused. Those who are reading only journals, taking out the latest guidelines are making a big mess in their mind. And I'm sure that you have to stick to books. That's why we are here in Preplato to tell you what are the facts. And I'm sure that I'm 90%, okay, 95% correct in what I'm saying. And 95% marks in Obzin Gaini, I think it's more than enough for you to pass and get good marks, okay? So please listen to us when we're telling you this. It does not increase the increased incidence of CA breast. It obviously does not reduce the incidence of CA breast. That I've already told you. Okay. So that was a very vehement, you know, contradiction of what you people have already heard. And uh, Thorat, thank you so much. And uh, 
please revise the two fundas you taught us. The two fundas which I taught you were FSH for estrogen and LH for progesterone. All right. And um, thanks, Alia. Thanks, Kriti. And tell us about risk factors I've discussed. What follicle number? What if follicle number is between 10 to 20? Uh, Clinton, yeah, yeah, that is um, not a diagnosis. We will not use it for a diagnosis. Then based on ultrasound alone, I will not make a diagnosis. I'll make a diagnosis based on findings of hyperandrogenism and also the irregular cycles and anovulation. So yes, that's a good question. Just 10 to 20 will give me an indication. Yes, earlier the protocol was 12 follicles, 10 to 12 follicles, isn't it? So it will give me an indication that she might be PCOS. And actually, I don't actually sit and count the 20 follicles. 20 odd we say so nobody actually counts those follicles good question doc it will give me an indication but i will not diagnose till i see the other factors okay mm. uh, dimple thank you prikshit is writing in a language which i can't make out i'm so sorry i hope you're writing good things about me in your language uh, prikshit please write in uh, some language which i can understand no, seriously, I hope you're not getting bugged with me. And difference between PCOs and PCOD. Yeah, uh, Rucha Misad. Yeah, that's a very good question. PCOs and PCOD and PCOS. If you know the difference, please send it to me because I don't. And some teachers, act, I'm so sorry. Uh, I don't know. I've heard somebody talking differently about PCOs and PCOD. I could be wrong. But one patient came to me and told me that, sir, on my ultrasound picture, I've got PCOS. And I was immediately telling that, okay, you've got PCOD, so these syndromes may stay for like, sir, please, I have PCOS, I don't have PCOD. And she was very vehement because some doctor told her that you have PCOS, you don't have the disease, you have just had this syndrome. I said, I don't know the difference. So actually, there's no difference. That's why I don't know about it. So it is used interchangeably. And if there's a difference, I don't know about it. You people should definitely not bother about that. All right. Since I'm seeing so much of PCOS day to day in my life, and this has never come as a question, please don't get confused. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Saeed Hussain, thank you so much. Uh, I think this will be recorded and available. And if it is not available on YouTube, somebody will send it to you. I'm sure the team is recording this and uh, those who request will get this. I mean, this was free for everybody. So I'm sure you'll get it. So what if follicle number? Okay, side effects. What if follicle was? Chunkal obesity might not be present in everybody. Yes, I told you already, uh, Dr. Bipul. Thank you. Prajit, sorry, thank you. Is there a chance of fibrogen cancer? I already discussed Shiva that yes, there is a chance of endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer. And uh, yes, fibroids are associated with the high estrogen levels. Yes, that is a very good correlation you made. But yes, it's not an absolute essential thing to have high estrogens to have fibroids. Fibroids are known to happen even without high estrogen levels. But yes, that is a correlation which I would like you to remember as PG entrance students, high estrogens cause fibroids. So I would like you to remember that. How detrimental is alcohol to PCOS? <laughs> uh, good question. I don't know. Pulkit, you stumped me, man. This is the question which has been asked me for the first time in my life. Alcohol is detrimental for everything in the body from head to toe. Whatever systems are working, they will not work properly. And I think uh, she'll not ovulate properly. If she ovulates properly, she'll not make a good quality egg. And if she makes a good quality egg, the embryo quality will be bad. And the embryo quality is bad. It will cause poor implantation. So alcohol itself is a cause of infertility. Alcoholism, you know, occasional alcohol intake has no problem. I'm not advising alcoholism here, please mind it. But yes, um, occasional alcohol intake will not have a problem. But then a person who is an alcoholic and a PCOS, that is not a good combination because at every level, alcohol can be a problem, right? From oocyte formation, ovulation, embryo formation and implantation and also abortions. So that way, alcohol is not good. But uh, particularly with the relation to PCOS, like I said, you stumped me for, for a minute. Okay. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, that is uh, Sunil, thank you. And Kirti, thank you. Prikshit, you're writing in a language. I hope you're writing me good things once more. Mm. Nalam, very good question. 
does the testosterone level increase more than 200 that's an excellent question pcos has Normal levels of androgens in women are 20 to 80 nanograms per deciliter and it increases more than that but not more than 200. It's a very rare thing to have more than 200 levels in PCOS. Very good question. I don't know. You guys are reading so much these days, man. I'm so impressed. I did not know this even as a postgraduate, you know, but very good if you know this because uh, we never go into so much of details. And, but it's a good question. Such high levels uh, reaching up to uh, 700, 800, definitely thing in terms of congenital hyperplasia. That's why we do the and synthetic acetate stimulation test also in uh, such high androgen people to see how much rise of testosterone and androgens are happening the next day. Very good question. So in PCOS, not more than 200 most of times. Uh, hair fall management PCOS who have hypothyroidism also. Hair fall management is definitely anti-androgen drugs will help and uh, hair cytosine management will eventually help the hair fall especially in women. Okay, androgenic alopecia is reversible in women especially but yes sometimes it is not as exciting results as you would want to have and women are also known to have hair transplants eventually to give them the best results. Okay, um, some other people also need something like that very soon maybe by the next uh, lecture how is uh, um, kushal very informative thank you so much radhika side effects of long term i've discussed why uh, em dweezy that's uh, i think that's not your name dweezy i'm just reading that why ocps can't be given postpartum immediately. Why? Because OCPs uh, are detrimental for the uh, milk letdown, isn't it? The Eastern component is going to cause glandular proliferation and cause the compression of the duct and cause a failure of milk letdown. So it's known to cause failure of lactation. That's why we will not give a woman OCPs, combined OC pills, all right? It's best that uh, uh, only progesterone pills, you know? Progesterone only pills are the best management if you want to give, uh, I mean, oral concentrated pills. The progesterone only pills are the best uh, to be given for patients with uh, postnatal contraception requirement. Dr. SK, thank you. Uh, Ritu Raj, can I watch this after a few days? Um, just, write a, uh, just write a note to Preplada team. I'm sure you can watch this again. Um, Mohit Bhagwaj. First line management with PCOS, Jipma quotient, weight reduction. I will definitely say weight reduction and diet. Always. I hope that was in the choices. Um, Raj Lakshmi, whether young girls with PCOS become infertile, whether all cases of PCOS become infertile without treatment. Raj Lakshmi, excellent question. I have enough PCOS patients. I mean, this is my experience ever since 96 that I'm in gynecology. For this 24-25 years, I have seen women who've come to the labor room who are very hairy, obvious hair suits, and the body has hair suits and they are full term pregnant about to deliver. Very good question. All PCOS will be infertile, not at all. Very, very good question. PCOS women will occasionally ovulate. They'll be mostly anovulatory, but Occasional ovulation is known to occur. There are many patients who conceive, they get married, they have ovulation, they conceive and they don't even bother. They, they will come and tell me, sir, my last period was three months back. And when I do the ultrasound, I see the pregnancy is only around one month or one and a half month. So how are your cycles? So they are mostly regular. And uh, I have got married around six months back and last three months back, I had no periods and uh, I checked the test was positive. And on the ultrasound, I don't see the pregnancy to be three months. I see it only to be one, one and a half months. So yes, you're correct. Raj Lakshmi, PCOS does not mean infertility for sure, increases infertility chances and occasional ovulation is known to happen in PCOS also, very good. Okay, so these now you're getting into um, good practice of PCOS already, now that you've understood the lecture, you're already taking points of your prior practice. So Raj Lakshmi, I owe a chocolate whenever you get your first patient of PCOS pregnant with her treatment. Okay, and um, Jat Saab, okay, thank you. Monisha, 
Kumaresan. Uh, can I can this be localized to a single area? That you know, a lot of girls ask me this. When a lot of girls have got acanthos on the neck, it's because of allergy, allergic dermatitis to the you know the garment. I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, the ornaments they are uh, wearing sometimes. You know, the gold chain, and if it's an artificial gold, sometimes. But I'm not an expert in that. The dermatitis sometimes is the cause of the acanthos around the neck, especially. And if they're using, uh, if they're sweating too much and they're not uh, having a very good axillary hygiene, then the axilla can also become dark without necessarily having uh, PCOS. And a uh, lot of girls who have uh, pigmentation in the groin, it's not because of PCOS. Yes, that's again a very good question. What is the significance of areca area? What is the significance of OCP's induced artificial cycle? Um, I, I seriously hope that you have my um, prep ladder app and the recorded lecture. It's a very good topic. You just, uh, if I can just tell you uh, very, very briefly here, because this is going to be a very long topic to discuss. I can just tell you very briefly that when there is the hypothalamus acting on the pituitary to make the follicle grow, and this will make the um, FSH make the follicle grow and this will make the estrogen. So if I use this information separately that the FSH will make estrogen to make the endometrium proliferate and LH will make the progesterone to make the endometrium secretory, isn't it? So what I do in OCPs, OCPs, what do I give? I give tablets of estrogen in a low dose, isn't it? 0 0.03 milligrams, and I get tablets of progesterone. So this estrogen will inhibit the FSH. Remember, FSH for estrogen. So if you give estrogen from outside, FSH is inhibited. FSH is not working, no estrogen made from the follicle. Then I also give progesterone in the OCP, isn't it? So that will inhibit the LH. LH not working, so there's no progesterone forming. No LH, no progesterone. See, because of your estrogen progesterone, that is the OCP. Because of this estrogen progesterone, LH FSH stops. So no ovulation. Now, how does she get periods? This estrogen causes proliferation. This progesterone causes secretion. And when you stop the tablet, she gets periods. So my tablet gives her periods. She is not menstruating normally anymore. Her FSH and LH has stopped. Her LH and FSH has stopped. So no estrogen progesterone production from the ovary. Ovary sleeping, the pituitary sleeping, ovary sleeping, nothing is working. My tablet has stopped all of that LH and FSH work, but my tablet will also stimulate the endometrium. Little estrogen is given, little progesterone is given, so little proliferation, little secretion, less period. So artificial cycle, the period is under my control. I am giving her the period. I give for 21 days, I stop, she gets period under my control. Please go and see the lecture, you'll understand it even better. But a quick uh, revision, I thought I'll do it for you here. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Smita has a very good question. Um, why can't we give spironolactone with OCPs rather than ciprotron acetate? Now, spironolactone, uh, given in a cyclical method, I mean, along with OCPs, can be given as a uh, method. It's a very easy thing. You give spironolactone separate from OCPs. But the pharmacology of combining drugs is the reason behind that. What we actually do is, in the estrogens which I give, the ethanol estradiol estrogen which I give, along with that, I give ciprotron acetate. And you would think that there is also progesterone in the pill, isn't it? You think estrogen causes the proliferation and you think the progesterone causes secretion and ciprotron acetate will give the anti-androgen action, isn't it? That's what you would have understood by the lecture of combined old concept of pills with ciprotron acetate. Actually, there is a, there is a slight smart uh, uh, change in the method of this uh, preparation. When you give estrogen, it causes proliferation. When you give progesterone, it causes secretion. When we give ciprotron acetate, it does cause anti-androgen. But ciprotron acetate has an inherent progestational action. 
so this causes secretion so this is not part of the combined drug which i'm giving so when i say a regular concept pill given with anti androgen it is only estrogen plus ciprotron acetate there is no progesterone tablet because ciprotron acetate will cause the anti androgen action and will also cause the progestational action and the secretory activity so that's why spanlactone doesn't fit into this profile because it will not have a secretory activity it will be an added third drug so that convenience is also not there all right so i hope this will give you a good understanding of what i meant uh, with what i had taught you okay okay uh amit singh thank you zenith anand after taking oc pills and having regular periods will she start ovulating later without medication zenith anand now, this is what uh, we uh, as interns get fooled into understanding you know a lot of your post graduates will tell you that a woman has a, having irregular cycles give oc pills what will happen how long do you give remember in the clinics they say so 3 to 6 months don't you say that 3 to 6 months of ocps what happens after that she will get regular cycles that is nonsense if a woman is pcos she's come to you at 20 years of age you give her 6 months ocp 6 months regular cycle moment you stop the pill next month she'll have delayed cycles maybe she'll have one or two months some cycles again she'll get into delayed cycles ocp is fooling the patient remember i told you oc gives OCP gives artificial cycles. So if you're giving OCP, you have to give it for as long as she wants regular cycles. Yes, that's why OCP is a given long duration. When she wants to conceive, she gets married. You stop the OCP, give ovulation induction drugs. That's the management. So don't think that if you give OCPs for six months, the woman is going to have a cure of PCOS. That is what is wrong. Okay. Lot of your teachers have told you this that if you give OCPs, the pituitary is suppressed, and when you remove the OCP, the pituitary opens up and it works with a rebound action and it makes a woman ovulate. That's nonsense, all right? That doesn't happen. Uh, so another interesting question somebody asked me, and uh, that's what I try to teach so many people. So should unmarried girl just take combined OCP pills to regulate her periods, and after marriage she can put on letrozole, Arka Nanda? Yes, you understood exactly what I wanted to convey. Very good. uh yes uh, i'm not mentioning the name of the doctor do we always have to be on medications well if you are a hypertensive you are adaptic don't you take medications all your life so pc is something which will stick around and uh, you don't have to take it all your life i mean you have to take it only when you want to have regular cycles and when you want to conceive you take the other type of drugs and when you have your children then you have to take only 5 days a tablet remember i told you progesterone is just for 5 days so that's wonderful isn't it just 5 days periods then 5 days next month periods isse acha kya ho sakta hai so good na just 5 days it's all right come on it's it's giving you regular cycles and you know when your periods are going to come when you know you can plan your life you can plan so many uh, you know events which are going around in your family in your day to day activities so you know when the periods are coming so it's just 5 days tablet so why is it so bad isn't it don't people take vitamins and uh, uh, you know you know this multivitamins regularly and don't they take uh, you know bodybuilding drugs and don't people take diabet anti diabetics and anti arrhythmics and anti hypertensives this is just 5 days a tab 5 days a month tablet i think it's all right okay so don't feel too bad about taking some pills from our side surya kant killer thank you so much for your remark uh, i'm really liking that and uh, inesh thank you so much uh, once again uh, what if cycles are regular and the only problem is hirsutism Only problem is hirsutism. Nikunj, I would say, is spironolactone and uh, cosmetic. Please don't. Uh, I have not discussed cosmetic management. Otherwise, the class would have gone forever. Cosmetic management is a very good management for girls with hirsutism because a lot of confidence in life. You know what happens with depression? You know, girl is hairy. Nobody in the family wants to talk about it. She's got a mustache. She's got a prominent beard. The mother and the father are ignoring this because it's a mm, taboo kind of discussion. Now she's feeling the. hirsutism she is feeling the eyes looking at her when she's going out in public life so she's getting depressed and what do depressed girls do don't say suicide all right they may commit murders these days <laughs> please depressed girls will overeat and overeating girls will become obese and obese girls will have insulin resistance and they'll become worse in their ovulation and they will not ovulate and the androgen lh will increase again and increase lh will cause 
more hyperandrogenism, more hirsutism will happen. So it becomes a vicious chain of events. All right. So give them the confidence. Fat girls, tell them to get out of the house, lose weight and go to the cosmetologist, get the hair rid of. They, they have this electrolysis and they have this uh, laser methods. There are many methods. Girls will do it better and get a look of a normal girl. I'm, I'm not against, you know, there might be some practices here and there, but don't get me wrong. As a gynecologist, it's my duty to advise that uh, getting some basic uh, cosmetic treatment and to look more feminine for girls is not a wrong thing. All right. Opinions may vary, but to look feminine is very important. Okay. Uh, estrogen does not suppress LH. If it is written that, I'm so sorry. Estrogen gives a negative feedback to FSH and positive feedback to LH. Uh, let's not get into the details of this. I've explained that. Tamoxifen, Amit Singh. Tamoxifen is also a selective uh, estrogen receptor modulator. It's given in a dose of uh, from 20 milligrams to 60 milligrams from again just like long citrate from the second day to the sixth day and it is also the anti isonic action is used tamoxifen is used for voltage induction amit you're very correct and uh, it is just given like uh, letrozole and clomphenicitrate in the first few days of the month and the side effects are much lesser the toxicity is much lesser it is given Can only lifestyle changes solve this, uh, Tripti? Uh, yes, lifestyle changes will give a major amount of relief because loss of weight is known to cause ovulation, regular cycles, and that will give the confidence of uh, her to, you know, keep the weight loose, weight less, and keep uh, keeping the weight in check, and that will make her ovulate. So regular cycles is taken care of, and of course, some cosmetic uh, intervention will give her near normal life. So yes, lifestyle modification. But that is 30% of patients. I will not say for everybody. That's around 30% of patients who do well. Are follicles less than 10 considered PCOs? Not for the diagnostic criteria, uh, Dr. Prajwal. Mm. Uh, Arushi, can you explain endometriosis to me? Now, we will do that uh, in one of those other lectures. Okay. Of follicles we can always do another lecture on endometriosis another very uh, exciting topic another very regular topic one in five to one in ten girls have i mean you know that also one in ten girls have endometriosis so that is also interesting topic to read can surgery removal ovary be an option <laughs> surikant please don't remove the ovary of a woman please never say that we must utilize the ovary because the ovaries is required not just for the estrogens and egg formation it has got a lot of immune function you know, it's got a lot of immunity uh, uh, action for a woman. That's why we never say a hysterectomy with oophorectomy for a woman less than 50 years. Suppose there's a fibroid which is causing menorrhagia and I have to do a hysterectomy for, uh, let's say, 42 years. I'll remove only the uterus and not the ovaries because the ovaries will give estrogens and keep a feminine and keep a bones healthy. And I know the ovaries will work till 50 at least. So give her immunity also. So yes, never say take out the ovaries, all right? Uh, I'm sure you're joking with me. It never, I mean, that kind of management is not good. Ovaries are very essential, just like testes are essential for a man, isn't it? If there's a testicular problem, you don't remove the testes, we correct it, isn't it? Now you'll understand, I'm sure. Okay, where, what are the risks? Okay, so can't we give spinalactone? Okay, done that, follicles less. Okay, okay, you've done all that. Please do elaborate. Tamoxifen done. Rima Patel. Thanks. Risk factor for PCOS. Okay, they are mostly the same questions. In relation of Pomina. Golapalli. Uh, any relation to PCOS with thyroid? Actually, no. I mean, they can be an association of hypothyroid with irregular cycles. PCOS may have hypothyroidism coexisting, but not as a diagnostic criteria. Even hyperprolactinemia is seen around 20-25% of patients with PCOS may have hypothyroidism and hyperprolactinemia, but this is an MCQ. So good you asked me this question, Pamela, that this is not essential for the Diagnosis of PCOS, hypothyroidism and hyperplactinemia may coexist, 
but not a diagnostic feature all right and uh, pulkit i already answered the alcohol question can you please explanation pieces with thyroid all right we've done that manjeet kothari is there any pregnancy complication yes there are more abortions and more uh, more abortions and uh, spontaneous abortion because there's a luteal phase defect the corpus luteum is not formed very healthy even after ovulation induction drugs so we have to give a lot of support of progesterone in the first part of the pregnancy and a lot of people who are in metformin are continued on metformin till around 12 weeks of pregnancy so yes there are more abortions and more anomalies with patients of pcs correct good question again Uh, Merlin, I've answered your question. Piece associated with early menarche? No, they're associated with early menopause, not with early menarche. Tamoxifen question, Shiva, I've already answered. Hadiya Jan, what uh, about consuming dairy products in soy? Uh, uh, apart from uh, helping in weight loss, uh, you know, uh, soy, I don't think it is helping in PCOS. I mean, of course, Ayurveda may differ from what I'm saying, but I can stick only to allopathy and uh, soy products are known to help. Uh, theoretically in all well-being of the body, but uh, whether it is going to help a woman over with PCOS, I'm limited in my understanding of that. Bhavika Milchandani, thanks. Thanks for the punchlines. Thanks. Thanks for your remarks, Bhavika. I think most of the questions are repeat. Sampna, Sampada, thank you for your remarks. Uh, PCOS and endometriosis. Parag Sharma, that's a good question. PCOS and endometriosis management together. PCOS is a hyperisonic condition. Endometriosis happens to uh, women with hyperisonism. So yes, there are a lot of patients, 25 to 40 percent, I will say. Some books say 25, I will say up to 40 percent of cases of PCOS end up having. But that's a little high for your book to write. Stick around 20, 25 percent, which is your book uh, answer that yes, PCOS may be associated with endometriosis because both are hyper and that is a problem with us because um, we have patients with endometriosis and PCOS, so surgery is the first management most of the times with a big endometrioma. But if there is a small endometrium, then endometrioma, then we know that PCOS will have regular cycles with the OCPs and OCPs have lesser estrogens in the body because it is an artificial cycle and OCPs are low dose. So that OCPs also help in endometriosis control. Remember, we have discussed in our uh, preplad wrap that in endometriosis, we can give OCPs as a management option. So yes, giving OCPs will help in endometriosis and PCOS both, although not in ovulation induction. Yes, it's a complicated issue. We can discuss more about it. Uh, my uh, FP forum is there with you, people to ask me questions, no problems. And uh, this Ram is fine. Thank you, sir, for the clarification, Rucha. Rucha, good. Thanks for your remarks. Span lactam question, Smith, I've already answered. Mm, I think I'll go the other way. I think most of the questions I've done, I think I should pull it up. Parth Naik, can we just remove one ovary which has species and the other one will keep it? No, Parth, you'll reduce the number of follicles. Parth, please don't take out normal ovaries and don't take out pieces of ovaries also because we need the follicles. I know there are many small follicles and those many follicles are not working properly and they're not ovulating properly. But when I want to treat this woman, I need the bunch, you know, the follicular number is limited, Parth. 
did we discuss that in the first menstrual physiology class that the number of follicles in a girl is limited from the day she is born she is going to be only reducing her number of follicles that's why she gets into menopause at 45 50 whereas a man will go on making sperms all his life that's why he can father a child even at 50 55 60 70 also he can father a child but a woman cannot have a child much beyond 40 years or even 45 years she cannot have a child because the follicle number is reducing progressively so now the follicle number is reducing she's got PCOS you remove one ovary no don't say that at all we don't say that we want to use those follicles for pregnancy by ovulation induction and by stimulating the ovaries to grow eggs and make uh, her have a pregnancy no I will not say that is an answer path and um, I think uh, Suryakant has also asked the same question and I think I'm coming back to the same question again. Uh, anemia on PCOS uh, no Anemia can, um, you know, severe anemia and having a general, uh, you know, uh, hyperpituitarism, patient may get into amenorrhea because of that. Now, all amenorrhea's and oligomenorrhea's are not PCOS. Malnourished women will have amenorrhea sometimes. Anemia may be part of that malnourishment, but that does not mean that she's got PCOS. She's got amenorrhea yes nothing is working in her body because of such severe malnourishment and uh, severe anemia nothing is working properly so that may also have a badly working pituitary hypothalamic suppression and may have a stress related um, uh, oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea so that's not anemia and PCOS. that's just malnourishment and not having cycles at all so that's no relation with PCOS per se all right, so uh, I think uh, the same questions are coming repeatedly. I think the ones which we uh, did not discuss, uh, uh, the ones are repeated now. So I think most of the questions I've answered and uh, those who have not got the questions answered, I, I feel that uh, uh, don't feel uh, any despair. We are always here to help you and we can always meet on the FB forum where we have. And uh, if you write an MCQ, uh, which you want to be solved and you don't want it to be discussed on the AP forum, you can write straight to the prep ladder uh, team and prep team will always write back to me direct questions also. And um, I'm available, okay, fine. I mean, that's not a big deal. You can always write back to me at Dr. Prasan at yahoo.com. And this is a dedicated uh, email for you people to ask me doubts and uh, either way whether it's the fb or this forum i'll be happy to take your doubts all right so exciting long discussion we had uh, i felt uh, rejuvenated again to take a pcos class it's always fun to take a pcos class right from basics and i hope you had the patience to sit back and discuss with me and uh, understand with me all of this all right so wherever you are stay safe and keep reading regularly uh, practice makes perfect but I always say perfect practice makes perfect so read properly read regularly and revise a lot more you revise with your friends especially the MCI students who are going to write the exam on 31st I want you people to revise with your friends perfect practice makes perfect all right and others of course you are going to write exams for the next uh, six months the PG entrance people and there are many exams coming up so wherever you have a doubt, please write back to me. I'll be the happiest to take them and answer them on time. All right. God bless you. Thank you so much.